Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the February edition of the Divorce Support Club with me, Claire Macklin and Lauren Freedy. Um, I'll just ask Lauren to introduce herself first and then um, I'll get going with um, the content for today. Thank you, Claire. Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, the session today. I'm Lauren Preedy. Um, I'm part of the team at Walker Family Law, um, dealing with divorce, separation, um, children matters, and any of the issues that um, are connected to that of which we deal with many within these um, clubs. If anybody does have any questions, then please do. Um, you can contact us privately or if you want to put it um, on an email to, to one of us um, afterwards, then please feel free to do that as well. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen so that you've got something else to, to look at other than me rabbiting away. Okay, so just a brief introduction, do this every time. Um, I'm Claire Macklin, I'm a breakup and divorce coach and I work alongside Walker Family Law I'm on a one-to-one -one basis with some of their clients, but also um, preparing these webinars um, that we record and have a complete library of um, for you to access at any time. Um, I'm a former lawyer, um, I've been divorced twice now, um, once when my husband left and the second time when I made the decision. Um, I'm also the author of a book that you can see behind me um, and last week um, won an award at the British Family Law Awards, which was amazing. Congratulations, Claire. Very Thank good. Thank you. <laughs> so the aims of the, the Divorce Support Club and what we set this up to do um, was to, to give um, something in addition to the legal um, advice that, that Walker Family Law um, are so good at giving. And that's to help you concentrate on yourself through this process and beyond it. And what we're going to talk about today really is kind of beyond this process sometimes. Um, to get calm and clarity, to work out what you can control and what you can't, to see options and choices and be able to make really informed decisions, to communicate more effectively and to create a new future that you're excited about. So today we're going to talk about dating and new relationships. Um, and there are a few other sessions that I would suggest you can go and look at in the library and um, that's available um, if you're a member of the DSC. So there are other sessions that we've talked about boundaries and we did a whole session around boundaries and setting boundaries and what they might look like in relationships. Um, we did also a whole session on trust um, a while back. So, um, you know, what trust looks like, the benefits of it, um, what it means and how you can start to build it. And last February, we also did a session around Valentine's Day and kind of reframing that. So I'm not going to talk about that really today. If you're worried about Valentine's Day next week, go and have a look at um, the session that we did last year. There's lots of hints and tips um, in that. And then there's also last month's session on planning for the future and creating a blueprint um, for you know who you are and, and what you want in your life going forward. So those will also all be really helpful. So dating and new relationships. This comes up a huge amount in the sessions that I run with clients. And one of the first things I say to people always is, you know, before you go out dating, before you think about new relationships, it's really important to know who you are. You know, know what it is that you want. Be um, really mindful of what you deserve and don't settle for anything less, um, as this lovely quote says. So work out your values. We talked about this a bit last time. What's important to you? What engages you? What motivates you? What fires you up and what interests you? Also, what qualities do your friends say that you have? And what do you admire in other people? Also, what irritates you? What annoys you? What drives you nuts? All these are clues to who you are, what motivates you, and what really, um, what really drives you forward. And I think it's really important to be aware of those things before you think about going into new relationships, because otherwise you might take forward old patterns, old ways of thinking, you might fall into um, the same, making the same mistakes again, perhaps in your new relationships. So that's the first thing, know who you are. And then I think it's really important to know what it is that you're looking for. So I often do an exercise with clients around designing their ideal partner. It's a really, really fun exercise. So we look at um, what your ideal partner's values might be. 
I believe that when you are in alignment with your values with somebody, your relationship is much more likely to last um, for a long time because you're aligned at, at a deeper level, at a core. Really important when you're doing this exercise, and you can just do this on a big piece of A3 paper or in a double page spread of your notebook, whatever, to make sure that the things you write on it are positive and specific and detailed. What you don't want is to put out there all the things that you do not want in a relationship because the universe has a funny way of then bringing that to you, whatever it is you're thinking about. So make sure that you phrase this in a very sort of positive way. And in a minute, I'm going to give you some examples from when I've done this session with clients. So think about what values you'd like a new partner to have, what goals perhaps you'd like them to be working towards, what qualities you want them to have, how they communicate, how they treat other people. Then there's physical attraction. You know, how tall do you, would you like them to be? How old do you want them to be? Um, what kind of job would you like them to be doing? Do they have children? Do they not have children? Do they want to have children? All of those things are really important. And I've got in front of me um, uh, my notes from when I was doing this with a client the other week. And just to give you an example, some of the things that they wrote on their, um, their double page spread about their future partner was, they want them to be kind, empathetic, generous, um, educated. They'd like them to have their own interests, be funny, intelligent. They would like them to get on with their friends and have a variety of friends of their own. Um, they want them to have good teeth. Um, they would like them to be fit and active. My client enjoyed um, cycling and traveling. They wanted somebody who enjoyed those things too, or was willing to do those things. Somebody that understands that they have children at home, um, so they won't be available all of the time. Um, somebody who supports them as being a parent, but without interfering. So you see all of these things are very positive. They're quite specific. And then ask yourself, are there any deal breakers? Now, I would suggest that you don't have more than three of these because then you're, you're sort of verging onto the, the kind of the, the, the more negative aspects of this. But there might be something or a few things that are really important to you that this person doesn't have or doesn't do. So some examples. Um, the client I was talking to last week had no smokers and no binge, binge drinkers on their list. You might also have um, no children. That's okay. If you don't want to be with somebody who doesn't have, uh, who has children, that's absolutely fine. Um, other people have written nobody that needs rescuing um, on their form, for example. So think about what are real deal breakers to you, things that are absolute no-nos. The really good thing about knowing what you're looking for is that you can start looking for signs the, the people you're perhaps seeing on dating apps or you're meeting in real life have the things that you're looking for. You can almost kind of create a sort of checklist. I'm not suggesting you take out this paper with all these things written on you, do a tick um, next to each one on your dates, but you might like to think about them after you come home and notice also how you feel when you're around them. Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel um, that you can be yourself? Those kinds of things. When you know what you're looking for, You'll recognize it when you'll see it. So dating, just some really sort of um, some general um, guidelines and, and advice that I've noticed from working with people through this. Dating can be really useful to find out about people and also to find out what you do and don't like. Also, remember, you know, you don't have to meet your future long term permanent partner right now. You could meet somebody who you might have a really good time with uh, for the next six months or for a year, or you might want a completely different kind of relationship. So perhaps you might meet somebody who you can spend time going away with for weekends. You can have the occasional holiday, but you, you don't miss perhaps your, your working life during the week, for example. And um, if you're using dating apps, um, and most people seem to these days, be really honest. Um, in those apps, use up to date pictures, um, show pictures of you perhaps doing things that you enjoy, um, doing your hobbies, um, pictures of you that show you as you are. When you're looking at other people's pictures, look beyond them, look also to the writing. So look at what they say about themselves. There are, I've, I've been on dating websites looking with clients um, and there are a surprising number of people who put themselves on dating websites with a couple of pictures 
and absolutely nothing in the written bit. They say nothing about themselves. You can't tell anything um, about those people. So I would suggest avoid those. Um, as I was saying, see dating just as an opportunity to meet new people. You might even just make new friends um, and to find out what you do and don't like. Um, I'd also say perhaps avoid going for the opposite for your ex. You know, there might be things about your ex-partner that you actually value. And that might be worth thinking about when you're thinking about doing your ideal partner um, description. If you're on dating apps, I would suggest that you get the other, if you're talking with people over, over Messenger um, on those apps, arrange a video call as soon as you can. Um, I've seen lots of people almost get into relationships over text. Um, and then when they actually meet that person, there's nothing. So get it out of text and into real life as soon as possible. Be safe though about it. You know, have a video call, arrange to meet up for a coffee um, in the daytime. Make sure that somebody knows where you are and that you have a friend you can call on um, to come and rescue you if need be. Um, and one other um, little thing that comes up often is, you know, be aware that you could be quite vulnerable when you first start dating, especially if your self-esteem perhaps has been knocked by your separation or your divorce. Um, you can be quite vulnerable to somebody who perhaps comes on a bit too strong, thinks you're really amazing, tells you tells you that really far too early, kind of love bombs you. Um, it can ultimately blind you to, you know, seeing whether that person is right for you or not. And that's another really good um, reason to have um, your kind of, your design, your ideal partner, so that you can check up, is this the kind of person that I actually like? Or am I just feeling excited because they seem to really like me? On the dating websites, oh, there are some people to avoid. Sorry, something's popped up on my screen. There we go. Um, there are some people to avoid, I think. Um, there's the love bomber. That's the one who wants to sweep you off your feet. They send you excessive numbers of messages. They might tell you that you're wonderful, that they love you really, really quickly, tell you that they fell for you from just looking at your photograph. They might encourage you to ditch your friends to go out with them or... Um, you know, it's all too quick, all too soon. And that could be a, fine, a sign that you've actually found somebody who really actually their ulterior motive is to control you, to, to get you really excited, make you invest in that relationship too quickly. Um, and then there's Mr. or Mrs. Angry. You know, this is somebody who gets irritated or annoyed quickly. If you don't reply quickly enough to their message, they might send you a barrage of question marks or um, get a bit huffy with you big red flag. Um, or perhaps their profile has lots and lots of details of exactly what they don't want rather than what they do want. You know, I've seen don't contact me if you're over six foot tall, don't contact me if you're too thin, don't contact me if you've got blonde hair, that kind of thing. Those people were going to be hard work. Then there's the ones you can't pin down. You might be messaging with them. And this is perhaps where the over-investing thing comes in. You might be messaging with them. They might be really funny over text. But the minute you ask to speak on the phone or you ask to have a video call or you ask to meet up, they disappear. And then they perhaps pop back into your inbox six weeks later. These ones are never going to be um, people that you can have a, a proper relationship with. Then there's the scammer. And I don't know if anybody on here has watched um, the, the Tinder swindler, but there are scammers out there. There are people who may have a sob story. So they've just lost their job. Perhaps they need some cash to tide them over. So they need some cash to come to the UK, which all sounds quite um, perhaps rather, uh, it sounds very dramatic, but it does happen. And I've spoken to people who it's happened to. So just be careful. Then there's the ones who aren't looking for anything serious, which is great if you're also not looking for anything serious. And um, when someone tells you what they're looking for, believe them. So if you want a serious relationship and there are people on there saying that they just want something casual, listen to them. Then there's the player. So the player is somebody who has lots of pictures of themselves and often with um, with out with friends drinking. Um, perhaps there's a man out there who has pictures, lots of pictures of himself with loads and loads of women. You know, those women aren't his sisters. They get around, they play the field and you won't be the only person that they're talking to. So just be aware of these things. Then there's the sexters, and these are the ones who might send you pictures of certain parts of their anatomy. Um, 
Not quite sure why anyone would want to do that, but they're probably looking for a casual hookup. Um, they'll ask for similar pictures in return. Just be careful if you're sending pictures out like that. Um, there's nothing you can do to control what happens to them after they leave your phone. Um, and then there are hiders, so those people who don't have any photos or they have photos and they don't say anything about themselves or they're hiding behind sunglasses. There's a reason perhaps that they're not showing you their face or telling you any information about themselves. And then there's the eternally single. They're always out, they've got a glass in their hand, out with the lads or the girls in big groups. Um, if all pictures um, on somebody's page are like that, then they're probably eternally single. They enjoy life as it is, perhaps they don't want to be tied down. So if you're looking for a, a serious relationship, these are the kinds of people poss possibly to avoid. When you do meet somebody, you perhaps you've gone for coffee, don't ignore those red flags. So look for things like how they treat other people. Now, how do they speak to the person who's bringing their drink across? How do they speak to um, the person that behind the counter? And really importantly, how do they talk about their ex-partner? Um, I've heard of uh, clients going on dates where the other person, all they talk about is how irritated or frustrated or angry they are with their ex. That's a massively clear sign that they're not over it. Um, also, if they're very critical about their ex, just bear in mind that there are two sides to every story. If they're very, very critical about their ex, and particularly their ex's identity, then one day that might be you that they're talking about. And I've mentioned love bobbing already. So just be very aware about somebody who comes on um, too strong, too soon. And then I want to talk a little bit about trust. And we've, we've done a whole webinar around trust, but there are some other things that... Um, that I think are really important in addition to the information there. Trust is so important because when you trust somebody, you can manage conflict together. You can raise issues with that person safely. You can feel supported. You know that your boundaries can be respected and that will give you the courage to speak up, raise any problems that you've got, ask for any clarity that you need. So trust is really, really important. Ultimately, it's about feeling safe um, and secure. And I wanted to share just a couple of um, really good ways of looking at trust. So I'm a massive fan of Married at First Sight. Um, it's one of my guilty pleasures. And Paul C. Brunson is one of the psychologists who presents Married at First Sight. And he came up with this nugget of gold, I thought, in the last series. So he says, what's needed for trust to flourish in a relationship is compassion. So kindness, gentleness, understanding empathy along with consistency so reliability it's not shifting it is um you you don't feel confused you know if you're confused in the early days of a relationship then there's a, that's a bit of a red flag you should not feel confused in the early days of a relationship and then transparency so it needs to be honest open and there needs to be honest and open communication those three things he says are essential um, for uh, for trust to flourish in a relationship. So look out for those things. Is there evidence that this person you're seeing is compassionate? Are they consistent? Are they open and honest about how they feel? And the second one is Brené Brown, who I think is fantastic. And she has a really, really good, um, you can Google this, there's a video around trust. So if you Google Brené Brown and trust, this will come up. She uses the acronym BRAVING. Um, and she says that somebody you can trust will respect your boundaries, so that's the B. They will be reliable. They will do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. They will be accountable. So if you tell them that they have hurt your feelings, they will listen to you and they will consider what they could do um, to make that better and they'll be apologetic. The V for Vault is interesting. That's about confidentiality. So somebody you can trust will hold your confidences safely and they won't share other people's confidences with you either. So you can trust them to keep quiet about um, anything that you might tell them. The I is integrity. So somebody you can trust will live in accordance with their own values and they'll have integrity in their actions. They'll also be non-judgmental. So if you raise an issue with them, that um, perhaps you're being vulnerable, explaining to them something um, that's hurt your feelings, perhaps, they're not going to laugh at you. They're not going to tell you that you're being silly. They're not going to tell you that you're being needy. 
they will listen and they will take you seriously. And then lastly, the G is for generous. So they will always give you the benefit of the doubt. They'll be generous in their interpretation um, of things that you say. And if you meet somebody who you can tick all of those off, then that's real evidence that you can trust that person. And then don't let your past experiences define your future relationships. This was a little nugget. I asked one of my clients for their advice about new relationships earlier in the week, and this was one of the nuggets that they came up with. So don't let your past experiences define the future. This new person isn't your ex-partner. So how do you do that? Well, one thing you can do is you can identify patterns that you might have followed before. Look at your part in how your previous relationships have perhaps um, broken down. Look at what you could do differently um, in these new relationships. And you can ask yourself lots of questions about your past relationships to learn from them. Um, and one thing is to understand what your triggers are in relationships. So have a think about what triggers you, what sets you off, what really upsets you um, in a relationship. And then think about how you usually respond. So when that happens, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? And what do you do? What do you say? And then think about how that kept you safe. Because when we're feeling under threat, our subconscious always wants to keep us safe. So your usual response is probably trying to keep you safe in some way. But it may not be useful anymore. So is that useful anymore? How is this relationship different? And what else could I do? And then some other questions, perhaps, um, when you're thinking back over past relationships around um, <clears throat> what you would like to change in terms of your patterns and your thinking. Could you be 100% yourself in that relationship? Or what, did you have to walk on eggshells? Did you have to be careful about what you said and what you did? Where did you perhaps make sacrifices rather than compromises? And what are you prepared to compromise on going forward? And what are you not prepared to sacrifice anymore? Ask yourself what mistakes you made. Um, so, for example, I know that in previous relationships, I've been afraid of conflict. So it meant that I kept things to myself. So small irritations, I'd kind of sweep them under the carpet because I didn't want to raise them because I didn't want to have a row, which meant that I built resentment up about those small things. And they stopped being small things after a while and became really big things. And I, what I realised was that by not raising those small things, there were several things. First of all, I didn't give the other person the chance to understand that that irritated me and do something different. Um, and secondly, I didn't then allow the relationship room to grow. If I raise issues now with a partner, then I'm allowed with them and we can talk about it. Then the relationship can grow. Our understanding of each other can become deeper. So one of the mistakes I made was fearing conflict. And now, actually, I see conflict potentially as a way to grow. So I've kind of reframed conflict in my own head. Where did you compromise your well-being perhaps for theirs? Where did you sacrifice your health, your well-being and put theirs above yours? Did you perhaps filter your responses to protect their feelings? Did you feel you could raise any issues or worries without fear? And did you find you perhaps, perhaps you found yourself making excuses um, for their behaviour? All these are really good questions to think about what you're prepared to compromise on and what you're not, and what there is for you to learn from this in terms of your own thoughts and feelings going forward. The other thing that my client said to me was, don't be afraid to show your feelings, even if they've been used against you in the past. And it can be really scary going into a new relationship, perhaps. Um, so don't be afraid to tell somebody that, that you like them, that you'd like to see them again. Um, perhaps um, you've been called, I don't know, needy in the past. I know that I've been called that in the past. It's now a big bugbear of mine. If you've been called needy for expressing perhaps how you felt or your ex didn't really seem to care how you felt, it usually means that you've expressed a need and they're refusing to meet it. Don't be afraid to do that in new relationships because... You will find out then whether this person is able to hear you, whether this person is able to, to listen and provide what it is that you need. You know, this new person is not your ex-partner, so don't assume that they'll react in the same way to you showing your feelings as your ex did. 
And then just some some red flags. And I think these red flags apply to any relationship, not just um, any new romantic relationships. So they can apply to friendships as well. So five red flags to watch out for in any relationship, really. So somebody who takes no responsibility for their part, they blame other people. It wasn't my fault. You made me do that. If you were a better person, we'd be happier. Problem with this is that everything's always going to be your fault and it stunts growth um, in the relationship. And, and fundamentally, it means that that person is never going to be able to see any need for change in themselves. Secondly, a refusal to communicate. Perhaps they stonewall when you try to raise anything. It's not the right time or you're punished with silence. Um, this kills trust and safety within a relationship. Thirdly, if there isn't any care or curiosity about how you feel or what you need, or your feelings are perhaps minimised. So this might present, for example, as changing the subject when you ask for something or try and explain how you feel, or it might be a downright refusal to provide what you need. Um, so for example, you know, you ask for a hug because something's upset you and they say no. Or don't be silly, you don't need that. Or don't be silly, you really don't feel angry about that. What this will do in the long term is stifle your ability to express what you need and to be vulnerable, which again will um, erode trust in the relationship. And the fourth one is that they meet your efforts to raise issues with defensiveness. So they justify themselves rather than listening to you. They're not really hearing you. I only did that because you did this. Or I was making a joke, you're being really oversensitive. This helps you, uh, it makes you question your reality. Um, it can be gaslighting as well. So it can make you question whether your memory is right, um, whether you actually are justified in feeling what you do. It's really not okay. And then lastly, making any issue you, you raise all about them. So if you say, for example, that something they did has upset you, they turn it around onto you and you end up being the person who's apologizing. You know, oh, I do so much for you and all you do is criticize me. I'm doing all this work and you never appreciate any of it. You're upset. What about me? Again, this will cause you to question your own worth and your own feelings. So if you spot any of these patterns in, in any future relationship that you have, big red flag, and it's probably time to, to rethink and um, perhaps even to leave. If you spot them really early in a relationship, it's time to run very fast in the opposite direction. And then lastly, just thought it would be worth um looking at you know when should I introduce my new partner to the children um, and I know Lauren has got some some things on this as well from a legal perspective um I would say that, that there's no hard and fast rule you know some people will say oh, you must wait a year or you must wait six months there's no hard and fast rule and every situation is really different your children will have their own grief or healing curve they'll be going through um those phases we've talked about so often you know denial shock anger bargaining, sadness and depression, perhaps acceptance. Um, so I think it's probably really worth going back and looking at the session that we did on supporting children through divorce. Um, and getting, you know, just taking some, some time to really think about how you can best support your children so that you can understand where they are on that journey, because it will be different to yours. So being really aware of how your children are managing their emotions in relation to your separation or your divorce is really helpful and can really help you think about when to introduce um, any new partner. I'd say err on the side of caution always. You know, get to know your new new people through dating, have fun, keep it separate for a while. Um, I think for young children especially, they can get quite attached quite quickly um, to new people. So be really aware of, you know, the potential for further losses down the line if they get really attached to a new person and then the relationship perhaps doesn't work out um, or, or ends very suddenly, um, just be really aware of that. So try not to introduce too many people in, in too short a period of time. They don't need to meet everybody um, that you date. Um, older children often need to be patient with them. They may be less receptive. They might be more defensive. Um, again, be really there to listen um, to your children and, and listen perhaps to, to some of their concerns. Um, and really don't pressurise your children or your new partner to like each other, you know, or, or try to integrate them too fast. Trying to, and I've made this mistake in the past, trying to integrate your new partner too soon really backfires um, on, on 
in a lot of on a lot of occasions. And um, I remember my youngest son giving some really good advice um, only a couple of years ago now. He said, you know, mum, don't look for somebody who you think is going to be a good dad figure for us because we already have a dad. Look for somebody who you like and that you enjoy spending time with and that you're choosing for you. And I thought that was spot on advice. Um, so, yes, try not to integrate them too quickly. Try not to in integrate them too fast and don't pressurise them to into liking each other. Balance your time um, between your, your children and, and any new relationship. And I think, Lauren, that leads me into, I know you had some, some thoughts on introducing new partners as well, perhaps from a, a more legal perspective. Yeah, thanks, Claire. And 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 as always, I've I've made a few scribbles of, <laughs> of some other thoughts as well. Um, yeah. So w when um we're dealing with divorce and separation matters in relation to money and obviously the breakdown of of the marriage or the relationship, um, inevitably, if people have got children, either um, uh, that there, there is often issues of of course where those children are going to live. Mm. But part of that can also be the issues that have come up in relation to the introduction of, of new partners. Mm. Um, and there's various things that, that we can look at to, to assist with that. Um, one of which is, is, is focusing on the family as a whole. And would there be a type of, um, I say, family therapy, mm. um, some type of mediation or family therapy or a family consultant that can help kind of navigate the feelings yeah. of everybody together and that might be something that the parents do together with the children or it might be something that one parent wants to do with the children um, but also to not forget the support that the school might be able to provide the children as well um, and that it, that can sometimes be a pastoral person or it might be a form tutor depending on the age of the children um, but in respect of of legalities there isn't anything in law that says as you've said, there's nothing prescriptive that says you cannot do something for a certain amount of time. And um, often what comes up is differences of opinion mm. in, in, in that aspect. But also there's also differenting issues in respect of how people want to parent. And of course, the issue if the other person has the, the new the new person in, in either relationship has got their own children. So it can be a lot to navigate. Um, I think that from the perspective of trying to keep matters out of court that's of course really important but if somebody is acting slightly recklessly or you think there's an issue with alcohol or fundamentally there's not an agreement on any contact issues then that is something that we can assist with and sadly a court process may be needed um, and sometimes providing that stability and um, court timetable can be helpful so of course the idea is is you hope that won't be needed but my, my message really is to, to not think that that's that that's not an option um and in that respect it, it's not necessarily about the welfare of the children if both parents are able to parent there's the other issues but don't be afraid to actually raise it if you think there is a welfare issue and that can be a really scary and difficult thing to to feel like you're accusing somebody of something but um it's it's important to address it so yes. to, so to not be afraid to raise it is the starting point i think and and um any issues in respect of 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 the the best interest and welfare and safety of children has got to be a, a primary concern for everybody and if one parent is failing to meet that responsibility then it, it needs to be addressed so that that's the, the my first message um there um i guess that that's um that links into and i hear this a lot um, in my sessions from the other perspective of my ex has introduced this person to the children and i'm not happy with it and yeah. fundamentally you know, and unless there are, like you say, sort of safeguarding welfare concerns, there's often nothing much you can do about it. And it's one no, of those things no. that you need to learn to let go of mm. control over. Uh, yeah, I have this myself. yeah mm. absolutely. And and it's sometimes it can be a head and a heart dispute, as in in your head, 
you know ultimately that okay mm. something might be a bit irritating or it might not be quite the way that you would have done it or or actually um the th one of the things that has just jumped in my mind that comes up as well is if you've got a new part if someone's got a new partner that's got slightly older children so for instance they're playing computer games that that you might not deem appropriate for your child or they've got a mobile phone so your child ends up having a mobile phone um that's of course not something that would be making a court application for but it, it's just a difference of a bit and, and if you can address it by discussing things of course um, but other things you may sadly just have to let go as it being we've talked about it before that happens in your household this happens in our household yeah um and and yeah. and also um the the, the I, i'll use the expression the court the court don't want to stop people moving on with new relationships and, and actually new relationships can be beneficial to the children um, uh, and, and open different um, avenues yeah. and give them different opportunities and that can be really difficult to stomach particularly if you feel like you're the one that, that if the other person has um, you feel that they've left you or if you mm. feel that you've been um, you, you've been very upset about their behavior so it's a really difficult um, yeah. situation to navigate yeah. and and that's why I would say that your role in conjunction with our role Claire is where that can be massively helpful in assisting people legally and also with the work that you do with our clients one-to-one -one. so yes yeah, so it's yeah it's often the emotional like you say it's the the difference between your head and your heart you mm. know you can't really do anything about this but you're but you wish you could effectively mm. Um, and I remember, you know, my first ex-husband introduced the children to his new partner fairly quickly. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, I just have to let go of this. And thinking, so long as they are treated kindly and they come back from weekends happy, then that needs to be enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's quite a, it can be quite a head, a, a mindset shift to, yeah. you know, to to get yourself in a place where you're comfortable with that. And I do lots of work with that, uh, around that with with clients. So, and and the other yeah. kind of legal thing that might link up with with this in in respect of new partners, is is in considering financial matters and how financial assets are being divided, mm. and particularly if you've still got joint assets at that time, which you may have if there's a property that hasn't sold or if there's agreements that somebody will stay in a property for a certain amount of time, or um, as happens in a lot of cases, there. A, a joint account is still maintained um, but sometimes issues come up with people spending money with their new family and new partner if I if I can put it like that and it it might raise feelings of jealousy but also feelings of um, well hang on a second this is this is our family money our matrimonial money that's being spent um, this is a very difficult area of law in how this can be considered um so again it's something that that needs to be talked about to, to with us from a legal perspective mm. as to, to what can happen and how should things be divided and and is it a conduct issue um mm. the other person may be um doing something that um that they shouldn't be they may not um but if money becomes an issue or somebody doesn't have access to money there's applications that we can make for interim maintenance there's applications we can make in respect of of legal fees so again to not be afraid to raise this and talk to us about it yeah i think that's really key isn't it you know to in order to know what what is available on a um a legally you need to ask those questions Mm. Um, and don't be afraid to to raise them and ask them and get the information that you need because once you've got the information you need you can make a really informed clear decision on the way forward that you, that you want to go yeah and then my yeah. only other kind of thoughts are, are things from um my dating days um also having um have having been divorced is the is the difficulty sometimes or, or forgetting how to listen to your own gut feelings mm. Yes. And and if you are being flattered or sent flowers, it which is lovely, and <laughs> I, I would always love to be sent flowers. However, it's that love bombing thing. There's the feeling, and it's just that that little feeling that you might push away. Yes. That actually you have to learn to listen to, and you're allowed to make choices, and you can be polite and and not go on another date with someone, or not go on a date with them at all, and to to not yeah. be afraid. And I think. As long as you're plight, <laughs> then that's and plight and as kind as you can be. I think that's that would be my my kind of 
thought on on yeah. that yeah um, if you've been on a first date and you it, it spark didn't fly for you or you don't really want to see that person again don't be afraid to send a message mm. saying thank you for your time i had a i had a had a nice evening with you but i don't think that there's anything in this yeah Full yeah stop. and and the other thing as well which um uh, which i'm it, it's easier said than done sometimes is the whole social media mm. first of all um it's probably best not to watch what the other person's doing on social media or if you've got mutual friends because that can be either torturing yourself or it it just emotionally I, I don't know anybody that's ever got any benefit out no, of it. No, it's like picking an open wound. Um, yeah, and the other yeah. thing of course is putting your own life on social media, remembering that um, once it's out there it's very difficult to get it back again and yeah. Um. And again, to just be to just be careful about it. I I know we're all adults, but um, everybody's entitled to go out and have a bit of fun and have a few drinks and um, just staying away from the social media is probably the best the best thing. Um, yeah, I totally and, agree. Mm, and then the last thing I I I that again was in my thoughts is is the whole opinions of friends and family. And again, we've done sessions on this before and boundaries and mm -hmm. to realise that, that, OK, friends may be defending you, family may be defending you, but actually they don't know what's happened in your life. They don't know how you're feeling inside. And yes, sometimes it can be very useful to get people's opinions, but sometimes it I, I've I found in my own experience and by dealing with a, a lot of clients, it can be really, really unhelpful and it can be even more upsetting and confusing because if somebody says, well, they don't think you should go out with that person, but actually they're meeting all of the criteria and um things that we you, you mentioned on your on on mm. in this talk today, and they're trying to talk you out of it for some reason, but that might be for their own reasons, not yeah. yours. Or it might be simply that, you know, they wouldn't find this person attractive. They wouldn't find mm. um, this person somebody that they would like to spend loads of time with. You know, I think there's there's a line, isn't there? Because I think mm. sometimes if, if all of your friends are giving you the same message about somebody, then it's time, then it's really time to listen um, and perhaps query whether this is the right person to you for you but you know if if you've introduced somebody to your friends and everybody gets on well with this person apart from one person then this you know mm. Um, mm. try not to take it too much to heart and I, I think you're spot on though with the listen to your own listen to your own gut mm. I mean I, I've been through lots of conversations with clients where they haven't necessarily listened to their gut and then further down the line it's absolutely proved to be right your gut is usually 100% spot on with what it's thinking if you if your gut is telling you there's an issue that's probably an issue yeah yeah and and again i would i would repeat what you said that we've done some really good talks on boundaries mm. on um relationships on third parties so um yeah. it's it's worth worth looking back at and dipping mm. in and out of of those things and absolutely we did one on blended families as well Oh um, yes, which would probably yeah. be worth looking at if you're thinking about new relationships. I didn't mention that one earlier. Mm, so yes, yeah, there's yeah. already there's already quite a quite a large um, body of resources um, on all of this ready for you to just dip in and out of as and when and, you want to. Mm, and the other one as well is I can't remember which session it was, Claire, but when we talked about the effect of of um, self esteem and the colours and positive thinking moving forward and, and mm. things like that which which also I I think links nicely to to this as well yeah yeah I mean there's there's lots of sessions around being calm and um you know uh, trusting yourself and all of that so uh, have a look look back mm. through the sessions that we've already done there's I think we're going to need lots of gold do an in an, in, an index at some point I think now aren't we just as, we we'll to cross reference <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly Anyway, it's been lovely um, talking to you today, Lauren, about this. Um, you know, it's it could be a really exciting um, area. And I know there's lots of, I've given lots of kind of warnings about what to look out for, what to watch out for, but it's also can be a really, really exciting time in your life. Yeah. And so, you know, I'd say also be really open, be open to opportunities. And so yes to got, invitations. Mm, yeah. And, and whether you've got children or not, you're entitled to your own time. You're entitled to to have some fun you're entitled to have 
um, relaxing time and to not and oh, and again we've done a topic about this it's the whole um, feelings of guilt um, yeah. but positive thinking and and enabling um, yourself to enjoy the things you enjoy doing is is a nice message to end on I think Claire it is I think that's a really good message to end on um, so with that um, I hope that you all enjoyed and um, taken something away from today and um, we'll see you next time Yep. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.